Coming up in the news at noon, an hours long standoff, now a murder investigation. The challenges negotiators faced outside a home on the southwest side. Plus, what fire investigators are saying might have started a fire at an apartment complex. Live from KZ12, the news at noon starts right now. An all night standoff has given way to a murder investigation. San Antonio police say the man who they have been trying to coax out of a southwest side home is a suspect in the death of a woman. And in the death of a woman. The standoff has been happening in a home not far from Loop 410 and Old Pearsall Road on Bright Valley Drive. As Katrina Weber reports, police say the suspect also hurt himself. A request from San Antonio police negotiators goes unfulfilled. Hours after a Southwest Side standoff began, they were hoping for a peaceful end. The police presence in the 6200 block of Bright Valley was in response to a phone call after 10 last night. A co-worker worried about the man in the home and what he had done. We did a welfare check. Officers peered into the window and they saw a person in there trying to cut himself and on the neck with what appeared to be a box cutter. That image made police back off and try other means to reach him. They say in an earlier call with his co-worker, the man who's in his 50s had confessed to badly hurting his roommate. He did hurt his roommate. Um, upon further checking, uh, we found that the roommate was deceased. Police called the man a suspect, but they were not able to say right away how his roommate, a woman in her 30s, died. Although this home has been getting the attention of police, they say this is not the actual scene of that woman's murder. Still, the question remains how this man, the suspect, ended up here. They asked that same question, and we don't have an answer for that right now. Police believe those details and more will come out once the man is out of the house and in their custody. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New this noon, we have an update on the public corruption trial of Michelle Barrientos Vela. It's now delayed. We know now the trial will be pushed back until next year. Barrientes Vela's trial was originally scheduled for Monday at Judge Velia Mesa's court. It's now scheduled to start Monday, January 31st. The ex-constable has been indicted on two felony counts of tampering with records. She's also facing three misdemeanor counts of official oppression. We'll keep an eye on it. And a woman is dead after she was struck by a van on the city's west side. This happened around 915 last night near the intersection of Castroville Road and Balboa Avenue. San Antonio police say the woman was trying to cross the street when she was hit by the van. According to officers, the woman driving the van kept going because she didn't immediately realize she hit someone. The driver eventually turned around and called authorities for help. The victim died at the scene. SAPD says the driver is not expected to face any charges. And right now, San Antonio fire investigators are still trying to figure out the cause of a fire at a north side apartment complex. The fire has left at least one person displaced. Jonathan Cotto tells us what investigators know so far. San Antonio Fire Department arrived to the Escondido Apartments on Blanco Road and 410 on the city's north side just before 2 o'clock. A little over two dozen fire units battled the flames coming from a two-story apartment building. Crews say the fire started inside a laundry room on the first floor of the building. The fire quickly spreading to a storage unit upstairs. The people who live in that building were safely evacuated. The fire department says the apartment sustained minimal damage and one person was displaced. That person was treated for smoke inhalation, no other injuries were reported. Now the damage to the laundry room is pretty extensive. Fire investigators are working to determine the cause. Reporting from the city's north side, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And happening this hour, Governor Greg Abbott is on the south side helping Toyota unveil its 2022 Tundra pickup. You see Mayor Ron Nuremberg there as well. The massive plant produces both Tundra and Tacoma trucks. Toyota one of the automakers that really hasn't seen the same supply chain disruptions its competitors have. Now, this new model was unveiled today. The plans, however, date back to 2019. That's when Toyota Motor Manufacturing Texas announced an investment of $391 million to prepare for production. That investment helped expand the facility by 141,000 linear feet equal to 470 football fields. That's a lot of football. Our Stephen Cavazos is there right now, and he'll have more on the new truck that rolled off the assembly lines this evening on KSAT 12 News, beginning at 5.
A scary situation. Fumes and sick passengers forced a Frontier Airlines flight heading to San Antonio to make an emergency landing at the El Paso airport. Six people were treated at the scene for possible carbon monoxide poisoning. Passengers say the flight's takeoff was delayed in Las Vegas for 30 minutes due to a leaky fuel line. Midway through the flight, they started smelling chemical fumes. Frontier Airlines has acknowledged the incident, but no word yet what caused the fumes. More than 200 passengers were on board. And the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is being found in more states across the country. At least five states have reported new cases. And so far, health officials say those who have tested positive for the variant haven't had severe symptoms. That's good news. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest from Washington. Health officials in New York are monitoring five people experiencing mild symptoms after testing positive for the Omicron variant. We suspect there'll be more cases emerging. The governor urging all 53,000 people who attended an anime conference in New York City to get tested immediately. Officials say a fully vaccinated man from Minnesota who was at that conference has tested positive for the variant. Hey, yo. Several of the Omicron cases have been linked to people who traveled to Southern Africa, including a patient in California and a woman in Colorado, who's also experiencing mild symptoms. Both were also vaccinated. I was thinking, oh, great, we don't have that variant here yet. And then I guess we do. In Hawaii, health officials also announcing they've confirmed the Omicron variants in their state. The Hawaii Department of Health has confirmed our first reported case infected with the Omicron variant. That patient was not vaccinated, had no recent travel history, and is said to be experiencing moderate symptoms. The CDC's Dr. Rochelle Walensky reminding Americans that while there's a lot of talk about the Omicron variant, the COVID Delta variant is still the one posing the greatest threat. Today we have 90,000 new cases of COVID-19 um, every day and that about 99.9 percent .9 of them continue to be Delta. Um, we know for every variant that we've had, it's better to be vaccinated than unvaccinated. The White House urging everyone to get the shots and those eligible for boosters to make appointments right away. In Norwood, Massachusetts, ABC's Martha Raddatz getting an exclusive look at Moderna's race to tackle the new variant. They say production could begin on a new vaccine within the month. And in an effort to combat a potential winter surge, the White House says Americans will soon be able to get at-home rapid COVID tests for free. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. Coming up, the Dallas Cowboys defense came up big last night in New Orleans. Larry Ramirez has the action for you later in sports. But first, find out how the San Antonio Housing Authority is making sure children and the elderly have a Merry Christmas. That's after the break. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by IAQ Cleaning. Hi, my name is Gilbert Ramirez and I am with IAQ Experts. I want to give the military and say thank you for your service. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Y todos los veteranos y todos del servicio, felicidades. Gracias por su servicio. And the season of giving is here in San Antonio. Housing authorities making sure local children and elderly residents in need get presents this Christmas. Well, this year, Saha is hosting its largest resident holiday gift collection, but it needs your help to reach their goal. Tiffany Huertas has more on what this means for Saha residents. A lot of people, you know, that's, that's up in age, they can't do as much as can people that's working. You know, so you had to go for paycheck to paycheck. The holidays can be tough for many families. So the San Antonio Housing Authority is collecting holiday gifts to make sure their residents have a gift this Christmas. So our community uh, is among the most vulnerable in the whole community in San Antonio. 98% are low income and our median income reported for a family of three falls just below 10,000 annually. Saha's goal is to collect 1,000 gifts. People have already started donating some from coloring books to board games. What we've been hearing from our elderly is that they like um, bed sheets, uh, slippers. They even want laundry detergent as their Christmas gifts. If you would like to donate, you have until December 9th. Gifts will be distributed at the central office. Susan says it's all about bringing holiday smiles to Saha families. It means that our families will get a respite from stressors in life. It means that we will have a uh, families who will be able to celebrate the holiday season. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. 
Taking a look at live cam over San Antonio had a very gloomy start to today, but the sun's trying to come out a little bit. Oh yeah, it's not trying. as bad as yesterday. No, uh, the fog was very thick yesterday morning. We had some patchy fog this morning. It wasn't so dense, but we had more light rain around a little passing disturbance zipped by overhead brought us the rain early today. The rain has moved out and we'll see the cloud cover continue to break up into the afternoon as well. But that means it's going to be another warm and humid afternoon for us as we wrap up the work week. We'll talk more about your Friday evening forecast and what you can expect this weekend coming up shortly. But first, the aquifer today, no change in the aquifer level, 665.6 feet. And in the pollen count, Mold is low again today, kind of boggles the mind a little bit. We were expecting it to be higher today because of the rain and higher humidity early on, but mold's low with a count of 320. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So this morning, kind of like yesterday, I was mm -hmm. telling Samuel that this morning I went to go walk my dog and had my house shoes mm -hmm. on. Very bad idea because now those are ruined because <laughs> it was wet. It was damp. But plus yeah. we have all the uh, tailgaters for uh, UTSA, it's big conference championship them. game this, this afternoon. And so. then the poor runners dealing with the yeah. humidity. And I know. It's not exactly sweater weather no. today <laughs> or this weekend. In fact, our afternoon highs will be running about 10 degrees above average for this time of year. For the next few days, that means we're closer to 80. We should be down closer to 80? 65. I know. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Yeah. It's like spring. <laughs> exactly, wear appropriate <laughs> Texas clothing. Yes. I've been saying it feels kind of, it just feels kind of balmy, kind of mm -hmm. tropical out there. Yeah, it was uh, definitely muggy this morning and we did have some patchy fog. Here's the time lapse, 6 a.m. <laughs> There's the fog, hard to see. Then the fog kind of lifts, but we kept a lot of clouds around, some passing light rain as well. But as quickly as that light rain moved on in, it's out of here and our skies have been gradually clearing since about nine o'clock this morning. So we're starting to see some blue sky, but that sunshine will help to warm us up. We're already at 74 at the airport light south winds, keeping our dew point numbers high measure of humidity. Our dew point numbers are elevated and that's where they will stay. Didn't get much out of this morning's very, very light rain. Many of our reporting sites didn't pick up on any rain at all. Pearsall, a trace, and then two one hundredths of an inch from Bulverde over to New Braunfels. So that didn't help us out a whole lot. It was kind of just more of a nuisance than anything for the morning drive. And looking ahead over the next uh, five days or so, we'll keep it rain free this weekend. And then early middle part of next week, some more low end chances of rain. I think it could actually play out a lot like it did this morning. Coverage won't be too widespread and a lot of the rain over the next five days will be fairly light. Again, we'll start to see those low end rain chances kick in by about Monday with our next front. We'll talk about that coming up very shortly. Satellite and radar shows little specks of green there. That was this morning's very light rain that now is up closer to the Austin area and moving into central Texas and behind it. Skies are gradually starting to clear out those hit that have started to see more sun over the past couple of hours are already in the upper 70s. Castroville, you're at 77 Pleasanton already at 80 and at Stinson in Southern Bear County. We are at 78. Notice though Austin still under the clouds with a little bit of lingering light rain. They are still in the upper 60s. Carrizo Springs Black, uh, bright blue skies. You're already at 81 and it's already 80 in Del Rio. So there goes this morning's rain. Little cluster of clouds and some of that light rainfall. This is a tiny little piece of rain making energy little dip in the jet stream here over south and central Texas that helped to produce that rain this morning. That disturbance will continue to move off to the east. So for the rest of the day, we'll see our skies clear out, but it will be warm and muggy. Looking ahead to your Saturday morning, morning temperatures low to mid 60s, cloudy and muggy again with some patchy fog possible on your Saturday. Tomorrow afternoon, we break up some of the cloud cover partly to mostly sunny tomorrow afternoon. Another warm day will be back temperature wise about where we'll be this afternoon. 77, 78, warm and muggy. You guessed it. We do it all over again Sunday morning. So unfortunately for the rock and roll marathon early on Sunday, we are looking at overcast conditions, some fog, some drizzle and temperatures in the mid 60s. Not ideal. 
steal there, unfortunately. And then even into Sunday afternoon, cloud cover breaks up a little, but we'll start to see an increase in some high clouds on Sunday. So that'll keep us mostly cloudy into Sunday afternoon. Nonetheless, still warm and humid with highs near 80 Sunday afternoon. Next front arrives early on Monday. This will move through Monday morning with a low chance of a passing shower and some drier air behind it. So we will be staying warm and muggy all the way through the weekend. Our dew points in the mid to upper 60s all the way through Sunday. And then behind this front early on Monday, they drop off briefly. We'll get a break from the humidity Monday, but then our dew point numbers in the humidity shoot right back up by Tuesday. So we will have a little more back and forth as we get into next week. Not so much back and forth today. Once skies start to clear out, we'll be mostly sunny into the afternoon, but that means it will be warm and it will be humid and uh, that's how we'll stay all the way through the weekend. Again, a break from the humidity and cooler Monday, but a lot of clouds linger. Some low end chances of light rain linger through the middle of next week as well. So some back and forth with a couple of fronts as we get into next work and school week, guys. All right, thank you, Katie, and good mm -hmm. luck to all the runners this weekend yeah. for the rock and roll. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of sports, Larry joins us now, and if you were watching the Cowboys, you might have missed the Spurs <laughs> performance last Well, night. a lot of people, I'm sure, were like me. They were flipping back and forth, right. especially once the Spurs tipped 9 o'clock here late, so you didn't have to worry about it early on in the Cowboys game, but later in the contest, you certainly had to. Spurs just beat up the Blazers last night. San Antonio had six guys scoring in double figures, including Doug McDermott. He was on fire, and in the NFL, Micah Park. Parsons and the Cowboys absolutely roughed up Taysom Hill coming up. He came, you know, just staying patient, and he finally came. Trayvon Diggs grabbed his first interception in three games and his league leading ninth pick last night in Big Board Sports. We start with the NBA, no Dame, no problem for the Spurs. Last night in Portland, the Blazers got crushed. San Antonio led from start to finish, and by as many as 31 points, Thaddeus Young scored eight off the bench for San Antonio. Portland turned it over 18 times, including one right here. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, screams and then dunks. The Spurs scored 27 points off of Portland turnovers. Some great ball movement here by San Antonio. Then DeJounte Murray fills the rim for three. He scored 15. All five Spurs starters scored in double digits. Keldon Johnson for the layup and one. He tallied 14. And the Spurs roll 114-83 for their third win in a row. How many people we had in double figures tonight? Like five, five or six. Five or six double figures. That's what it's about. I mean, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, it's basketball. They make runs. Uh, you know, we responded well. And we kept our heads up and, and kept fighting. Spurs are off today and will play at the Golden State Warriors tomorrow night at 730. They are second best in the West. No Devin Booker. Well, no worries for the St. Phoenix Suns who continue to roll this season. JaVale McGee was doing his thing down low while Cam Johnson and Cameron Payne both scored 19 points to help the Suns win 114 to 103. Their franchise record 18th win in a row and proven to 19 and 3 best in the West. They'll play at Golden State tonight then host the Spurs Monday night. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. It wasn't pretty, but acting head coach Dan Quinn led the Cowboys to a win last night in New Orleans. A must win for the boys. First quarter, Dak Prescott throws a fade to the end zone where Michael Gallup makes an incredible one-yard catch, getting both feet down and bounds for a Cowboys touchdown. 7-0 lead. Great concentration by 1-3. Third quarter, Cowboys up 13 to 10. The toss goes to Tony Pollard. He breaks through the line and he's going the distance. 58 yards to pay dirt and the boys go up 20 to 10. He led Dallas with 71 yards on the ground. Zeke had 45 on 13 carries. Fourth quarter, same score. Taysom Hill looking to pass and he throws it right to Cowboys defensive lineman Carlos Watkins and he races back 29 yards for the pick six. Every D lineman's dream for sure. Cowboys lead 27 to 10. They win 27 17, snapping their two game slide. I mean, a win's a win. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, as you just said, the adversity we've, we've had, we've faced um, coming off the, the last two weeks and then coming in this week and just being hit with the COVID, uh, losing, losing the head coach this week. And just, I mean, so many people stepped up. Credit to Dan Quinn, uh, the coordinators, uh, all the leaders on this team of, um, of, of doing what was necessary to be ready for this game and then just uh, through the ups and this, up and down in this game. I'm um, playing complimented football when we weren't doing our job on offense, defense, uh, we're creating turnovers. So, I mean, 
um, tough to come in a place like this and win, and we're able to do that. Good morning. Dallas intercepted Hill four times, including the sweet pick by J. Ron Curse in the second quarter. Replay showed he got both feet in bounds. Dallas will next play at Washington Sunday, December 12th. Uh, boys certainly need a break to rest up. Yes, and get it, all the coaches back and everything <laughs> yeah, right. for that game, too. What a good season for them, though. Yep. Yeah. So far, so good. We'll Thank see. you, Larry. Coming up in the next half hour, we'll have the latest on the deadly shooting at Oxford High School in Michigan. Why the shooter's parents could be facing charges. Plus, Alec Baldwin gives his first interviews since the shooting on the set of Rust that killed a cinematographer. We'll hear his side of the story next at noon. Now to the ABC News exclusive interview with Alec Baldwin, the actor and producer revealing new details about that deadly shooting on the set of his movie Rust. Baldwin says he decided to speak out because he couldn't wait for the investigation to be completed before telling his side of the story. ABC's Rena Roy has more. In an ABC News exclusive, Alec Baldwin speaking out about the moments leading up to the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. Baldwin says the gun went off on its own during rehearsal and that he has no idea how a live round ended up inside. The idea that a real bullet was in that gun and would come out of that gun and kill that woman, that, that was not even in the realm of possibility. And that's the thing that they must find out is where, who brought bullets onto the set. Baldwin saying that just moments before the shooting, assistant director Dave Halls announced the gun was cold. An attorney representing Halls said it was not his responsibility to confirm whether the gun handed to Baldwin was loaded. Well, cold gun means there's no charge in there. There could be dummy rounds. A dummy round looks like a real bullet, but it's inert with no explosive charge. Veteran armorer and prop master Dutch Merrick tells GMA his protocol is that only the armorer should handle the gun. Our best practice, we have a chain of custody that the armorer handles the gun from start to finish. It goes right into the actor's hands, only between us and the actor. Nobody else should be involved. Investigators say a 45 caliber bullet was in the gun, killing Hutchins and wounding the director, Joel Souza. Someone is responsible for what happened, and I can't say who that is. The investigation is going to be into who allowed this to happen. How did it happen? And it's not just about Alec Baldwin, the actor who was holding the gun. It's about who allowed that live round to get on the set and into that gun. Those are going to be the key questions. Halls told investigators he didn't know there were any live rounds in the gun, and an attorney for lead armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who is in charge of the guns on set, says his client also doesn't know where they came from. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. I don't even know. Now to the latest on the deadly shooting in Michigan. A prosecutor has filed charges against the shooter's parents. Jennifer and James Crumley, the parents of Ethan Crumley, who we see here, are now facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Oakland County prosecutors say the gun legally purchased by Ethan's father was, quote, freely available. The 15-year-old is being charged as an adult with more than two dozen crimes, including murder, attempted murder, and terrorism. Making headlines this midday, Congress avoided another shutdown after both chambers passed a stopgap spending bill to extend funding through mid-February. The Senate approving the bill with a 29 to 20, 69 to 28 vote Thursday evening. Earlier in the day, the House passed a continuing resolution for short-term funding. And now heads to President Joe Biden's desk where he is expected to sign it. The passage of the bill came ahead of today's deadline, ending a standoff that would have resulted in a shutdown. In other news, actor Eddie Mecca has died. Mecca was best known for portraying Carmine, the big ragu ragusa, on the hit TV show Laverne and Shirley. The character served as a love interest for Shirley. Laverne and Shirley ran on an ABC from 1976 to 1983. Mecca received a Tony, Tony nomination for his lead role in The Lieutenant on Broadway in 1975. He also had roles on TV shows The Love Boat, Family Matters, and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Mecca died at his home in California at the age of 69. Facebook has reportedly made hundreds of thousands of dollars selling ads that promote anti-vaccine messages and compare America's response to COVID-19 to Nazi Germany. In one ad, Facebook promoted a sweater with the words, I'm originally from America, but I currently reside in 1941 Germany. 
Facebook's parent company Meta says these ads went against their, face, their vaccine misinformation policies. They still ran on the platform, though. A researcher who tracks advertising on Facebook says the company does not manually review all of the ads it sells. America's economic recovery is slowing down just a bit. The Labor Department says employers added 210,000 jobs to the economy in November. That's well below anal analyst expectations. It's also the smallest number of jobs added since this time last year. Some economists expect hiring to slow down this month because of concerns over the new Omicron coronavirus variant. But one bright spot, the unemployment rate fell to 4.2% a new pandemic era low. Taking a look at live cam right now near the airport this midday, maybe people heading out for lunch and their weather, fewer clouds greeting them. I and say. I can bet you crowds are heading over to the Almodome, right? For mm -hmm. the for tailgate. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Big game Good for the for Roadrunners. That. Yeah, definitely exciting. Uh, it's not really going to feel a whole lot like football weather in December. I think some folks would probably like it to be a little cooler, but generally speaking, it will be warm and humid for the rest of the day all the way into the weekend. I've got your evening forecast coming up in just a couple of seconds, but yeah, we're seeing some clearing out there after some early morning light rain and fog. Take a look at temperatures off to the south and west from Del Rio all the way down to Carrizo Springs and Catula. You guys cleared out a lot quicker, so you're already a good bit warmer. You're in the low 80s there. We're at 73 in New Braunfels and 76 in Kerrville. Temperatures will jump into the upper 70s. We will have some spots in the low to mid 80s this afternoon, especially south and west of San Antonio, so it will be unseasonably warm and also fairly humid through the afternoon. Winds will be light out of the south southeast, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Plenty of sun out there, especially as the clouds from this morning continue to clear out off to the east. So this evening, if you've got plans to head out to uh, the tailgating event, the UTSA game, whatever you may have in store tonight, you really won't need a jacket or a sweater. Temperature slowly falling into the mid to upper 60s um, well after the sun goes down. So we've got an unseasonably warm weekend ahead. We'll detail your weekend forecast and also get Get you ready for our next cold front that arrives Monday coming up in just a bit. Samuel. All right, Katie. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Katie. As variants continue to emerge throughout the pandemic, health officials recommend frequent hand washing in school to keep kids safe. With more, here's ABC's M. Went. Washing hands is one of the most important things kids can do to stay safe in school. Washing for at least 20 seconds with soap and water often is the key to prevent the spread of germs. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol is a good substitution if soap and water aren't available, such as in cafeterias, classrooms, and gyms. Children under the age of six should be supervised when using hand sanitizer to avoid swallowing or contact with eyes. School staff should build time into the day for children to take hand washing breaks after the bathroom, before lunch, and when playing outside. Visual cues such as hand washing posters or incentives such as stickers are great ways to motivate kids to wash their hands. Adults should do the same for good role modeling too. With this Medical Minute, I'm M. Wynn. Led by Dalton and Doug Brooks, the Shiner Comanches advance in the high school football playoffs. Larry Ramirez has more later in sports. And Zoom is planning in, on releasing a new tool that might prevent you from skipping out on those virtual meetings. We'll have the tales after the break. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Ulta reporting strong Q3 numbers after the bell Thursday, reporting an EPS of $3.94 and revenue of $2 billion. Ulta Beauty has beat on the top and bottom lines for four straight quarters and is providing strong guidance going forward. Shares of the company have gone up around 31% year to date. The Federal Trade Commission suing to stop NVIDIA's acquisition of ARM, ARM, a chip design and software company, due to antitrust concerns. The acquisition would be worth around $40 billion, and the FTC is arguing that the deal would give NVIDIA one of the biggest chip companies control over companies' computer technology and designs that rivals use for their own products. This comes as the FTC continues to step up its antitrust enforcement since Lena Khan was appointed to lead the agency.
And DocuSign reporting strong Q3 earnings for its latest quarter, but saw shares take a 24% drop following the report. The company reported earnings per share of 58 cents on revenue of $545.5 million and expects to see revenue for its fourth quarter come in somewhere between $557 million and $563 million. And that's your Cheddar News Business and Tech Update. I'm Brad Smith from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. An update now to some late breaking news. We told you about it at the top of the newscast. A standoff on the city's southwest side that had been going on since last night is now over. San Antonio police releasing an email saying that the standoff has, quote, concluded, but they did not indicate if the suspect is in custody. This all started around 10 p.m. last night at a home on Bright Valley in a neighborhood off 410 and Old Pearsall Road. Chief McManus, who was on the scene, confirmed one person is dead and they were waiting for the suspect to come out. As we said, SAPD says the standoff is over, but no word on the status of that suspect. And we'll bring you more information as that becomes available and watch KSAT.com for that for updates throughout the afternoon. Uh, moving on to some other news now. Think you can stay up, show up late to a Zoom meeting? Well, think again. Your next Zoom meeting might have a feature called attendance status. Attendance status. Make it easier for the meeting host to see who has and who hasn't joined the meeting. Who asked for this, Alicia? I have no <laughs> idea, but I bet people are cringing at this. But for those who sign on late, your names will go under a new not join section. Talk about shame. And it's going to be right in the participants panels for everyone to see and before you think ah, well I'll say I didn't get the invite this new tool actually shows your calendar response so yeah, yeah. watch <laughs> out show up at the meeting just mm -hmm. you know beyond put up the slate or something like that in the spotlight this day Netflix is making a movie about a famous Thanksgiving text mix-up that turned into a tradition and an unlikely friendship. Jamal Hinton and Wanda Dench celebrated their sixth Thanksgiving together this year. They first met in 2016 when Dench sent a text inviting Hinton over for dinner. Gosh, I love this story. It was meant for her grandson who had changed his phone number. Hinton, then a high school senior, accepted the offer anyway, and she welcomed him for dinner. Their story went viral on social media, and now it will be recounted in a movie called The Thanksgiving Text. Oh, very certainly. appropriate. Yeah, very appropriate. Doesn't feel, the weather doesn't feel like Thanksgiving no, or Christmas. No, But here. we can be grateful that we live in Texas and it's not cold. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, for people that don't like the cold, this is about as good as it gets mid to upper 70s in December. And we'll continue this trend all the way through the weekend. So no sweater weather over the next few days. The aquifer has uh, not changed in the past 24 hours, 665.6 today. And another day, another low count of molds. Today they came in with a count of 320. We'll take a low mold count any day we can get it. We'll take another look at your weekend forecast coming up. Welcome back, 1246, uh, 75 degrees out there. Yeah, does not feel like December, Katie Blake. Uh, no, so <laughs> I've got rooftop weather this afternoon, which means, mm -hmm. of course, we've got to be on the roof. So I was digging through my closet, and I'm like, dang, I can't even wear a sweater. Nope. With my jeans. No, it's like it, I was dealing with the same thing, planning for the uh, tailgating. It's yeah. like, what do you what do you wear today? <laughs> Short sleeves, which yeah. for some people, hey, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Not much fuss. And there you go. And that's how our weather will stay all the way through the weekend. Definitely not sweater weather the next few days. I wanted to point out the almanac because it shows our average high for today. That's 67. So if you want to kind of think of it in terms of uh, the average is where we should be this time of year. Our records are up in the mid to upper 80s and we won't be getting that warm, but we won't exactly be average over the next several days. We're looking at our afternoon highs near 80 with elevated humidity. It's going to be feel feeling very balmy over the next couple of days. Now we do see our temperatures drop back closer to average by early next week, thanks to a front that will roll in early on Monday and some pretty persistent cloud cover early middle part of next week. We'll talk about that forecast shortly. 74 now at the airport. You can see our sensor is reading mostly cloudy, but we've got a good amount of blue sky out there. Just some lingering fair weather clouds and we'll continue to see plenty of sun for the rest of the afternoon. At some point this evening, depending on where you are, skies could even become completely clear. Regardless, with higher humidity in place, we will not cool down very fast this evening. By 7 p.m., we're still near 70 degrees into the mid to upper 60s by 10 o'clock. So uh, for any tailgating you may be doing today for UTSA uh, or any Friday evening plans, 
not exactly sweater or jacket weather. A slow cool down thanks to some muggy air. Satellite and radar shows the rain from early this morning continuing to move away and off to the northeast. It's cleared out of Austin now and it'll be taking a lot of this leftover cloud cover with it. So those of us with temperatures in the lower 70s for now will really start to see the temperatures climb over the next few hours. We're already at 82 in Catula also at 82 in Carrizo Springs. Here are our dew point numbers. With the exception of Rock Springs, dew points are in the mid to upper 60s. So it is feeling muggy thanks to a south wind. And these numbers will not be changing over the course of the weekend. So we're going to keep this muggy air in place all the way through Sunday. And then finally, our dew points drop again early next week on Monday behind a front that will move through Monday morning. But notice more back and forth next week with our humidity. They're back up higher by Tuesday. They fall again on Wednesday, so we will see some back and forth there. With sunshine across parts of the Concho Valley up to the I-20 corridor, it's already 77 in Abilene, 81 in San Angelo. So a lot of warmth across parts of Texas currently. Uh, also uh, fairly mild across parts of the deep south 70s from New Orleans up to Atlanta. But here's the cold air. It's well off to the north along the Rockies and then up near the Great Lakes through a portion of Minnesota there. It's all stuck in Canada. The reason for that, the jet stream is elevated elevated uh, well to our north as well. These lines you see here, those are the jet stream winds. So our polar jet stream that holds all the cold air, it's elevated way to the north and we're not going to get any of those big dips in the polar jet stream here in the short term. So that's why things will be staying so uh, unseasonably warm for us over the next several days. So looking ahead to your weekend, we'll start off tomorrow with more clouds, some patchy fog possible. We'll see some clearing in the afternoon. Sunday morning, I think even more fog, probably some more drizzle early on Sunday morning as well. A little bit of clearing into Sunday afternoon, but we'll likely keep more clouds around into the end of the day on Sunday. And then here comes our next front. This will move through early on Monday with a low chance of a quick hitting shower. And then our humidity drops very briefly on Monday. So if you're planning your weekend, just know it's going to be a lot like today warm and muggy with morning clouds and fog possible and then a bit more seasonable early next week. We'll be right back. How about it for the football players that came out tonight to hang out with us? Give them a round of applause over here. Roadrunners getting a lot of love before playing football tonight in Big Board Sports. This was the scene on the campus of UTSA last night where the Roadrunners held a giant pep rally before facing the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers tonight in the Dome for a shot at their first ever Conference USA Championship. Head coach Jeff Trailer was on hand along with Mayor Ron Nirenberg, School President Taylor Amy, UTSA Athletic Director Lisa Campos, cheerleaders, and the entire football team. Coach Trailer thanked the fans and then had some fun with them. I feel like I know all of you. I think we passed out cookies, donuts, pizza. I apologize that I've introduced myself more than once to you, but we are so grateful. Uh, your support this year has just been fantastic. I do want to practice if you don't mind. All right, we're going to practice real quick. You ready? Bailey Zappi is supposedly, supposedly the best quarterback in the country. He wears number four, right? Number four, right? Very good. I'm going to pretend like I'm him. All right, all right, so when I run on the field, that's when y'all get loud as you can, right? Now, look, we're not done. When you see him communicate with his hands, he's changing the play then, right? So what do we do then? We get louder, right? So we're going to practice. I'm Bailey Zappi. I'm running out on the field right now. You ready? Here I come. Yeah. Good. Be very loud when the Hilltoppers have the ball. Here's the matchup. WKU versus UTSA, 6 p.m at the Alamo Dome. The Incarnaburg Cardinals are in the second round of the FCS playoffs for the first time in school history. They'll face number one ranked and undefeated Sam Houston State Bearcats tomorrow in Huntsville. This after knocking off Stephen F. Austin at home last weekend, 35-28 in overtime. We definitely, you know, we're trying to prove something on Saturday that, you know, we can play with the with the top teams in the nation because, you know, we haven't really got respect much of the year. Uh, we'll see, you know, they got some good defensive players for sure, so it'll be fun to just go out there. You know, one of the best offenses against one of the best defenses, so we'll see how it matches up. Kickoff tomorrow in Huntsville is set for 2 p.m.
One of the most anticipated rematches of the playoffs, 13-0 Shiner taking on 13-0 Refugio in the Class 2A state quarterfinals last night. Comanche strike quickly after a Tyler Bishop interception. Dalton Brooks hurdles over a defender for a two-yard score and 7-0 Shiner. Later in the game, Dalton's brother Doug bursts through the line and is off to the race. As a look at the big fellow weaving his way through the defense. Not just power, he's fast as well. All the way down to the two-yard line, Dalton finishes the drive off with a two-yard score. Comanche's roll into the state semis with a dominant 55-14 victory. Here are the stats. Dalton had 374 yards rushing and six touchdowns. Doug, 101 yards and two touchdowns. The defending state champions definitely looking good, and they go as the Brooks brothers go. Ah, yeah, definitely, for sure. All right, Larry, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Larry. And SA Live is wrapping up Holly Jolly Week with a Flashback Friday. Mike and Fiona, what do you have for us today? Well, it is all about Christmas this week, and we are wrapping up our Holly Jolly Week. It's been <laughs> so much fun. Yes, and you know what they say, chili today, well, hot tamale. We're <laughs> making a chili recipe with a local chef and tamales with Chilitos Express. Okay, and it's time to get your sewing machine out. It's time to make your own ornaments and gifts. Some holiday projects that are so simple, you can do them with your kids. Then we're taking you out to James Avery for a sneak peek at all of their merry and bright new holiday jewelry. And if you're looking for the perfect gift, of course, shop local. Stephanie Pena Frost is here with a gift guide for everyone on your list. Great stuff. Then baking our day with the holiday treats. And of course, there's nothing to get you in the good Christmas food with a, a great program with a lot of singing and music. And a special holiday program is coming up at First Baptist Church of San Antonio. All that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes.